So I'm going to be speaking about under what circumstances is the acquisition of nuclear weapons a rational defense um, strategy, okay? And uh, I'll be speaking to you about the nuclear warheads and, uh, you know, nuclear weapons uh, pertaining to different countries, okay? Okay, let's see who's online here. to different countries okay all right great I think I can hear myself here okay so you know when the policy of deterrence becomes uh, unpredictable to the point where a country strikes their nuclear um, weapons test missiles uh, despite the assistance of diplomatic peace talks uh, the rational actors has two options First is the defense strategy, okay, and the second is the offensive strategy. So, what is the defense strategy and the offensive strategy? I think let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about the uh, United States of America's grand strategy, okay? Since the event of Donald Trump became the new president of America, taking office in January 20, 2017, scholars had speculated that events that escalated over time and termed this, uh, you know, as I would say, a timely period of his presidency as a grand strategy, okay? I think a lot of authors uh, speak about this, and if you're a researcher on this topic, you will definitely know what is, a grand, what is the grand strategy of Trump, okay? So I think the first, you know, Trump's six months in office was, uh, one of some of the doctrines that he highlighted, which is America first, okay? I think that was one of the key uh, strategy that Donald Trump uh, championed. So it was a doctrine. Uh, there are three key st strategic maneuvers that have been deployed very successfully in recent America's uh, international affairs, okay? The first is the executive order of immigration, okay? So, you know, actually, um, as myself as an you know immigrant when I was in America too, um, and also you know a lot of folks here in India as well who are you know, immigrants from other countries, uh, I think maybe this might be pertaining to you, or maybe it might be a little uh, you know relevant to you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and I, I suppose uh, folks from Ukraine as well who are moving to uh, different countries. So, by the way, uh, I want to talk to you about this nuclear uh, deterrence or uh, nuclear warfare. Uh, this particular juncture is because I think it is very important for us to analyze and sort of understand what happened in the past and you know uh, because Russia and Ukraine have been uh, on the you know on this you know vortex of this whole nuclear uh, you know uh, rhetoric and war rhetoric and warmongering and all that stuff so maybe you know we can have uh, a little bit of discussion regarding the nuclear crisis which pertains to these countries okay which I'll be speaking to you about so you know this is important to America's acquisition like I said the whole grand strategy of nuclear weapons as a rational defense strategy because of a security risk consequences so you do have uh, security issues as well because illegal immigrants or immigrants with their agenda to kill Americans are prevalent and unfortunately you know uh, some managed to enter inside the territory and also very unfortunately the genuine good people and the legal immigrants are also affected okay you know others become indoctrinated okay why because the deception and coercion is very intense especially like among um you know terrorist groups like isis uh, and sort you know all that sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, militant group. So the hybrid warfare, which was adopted by Iraq and Syria, okay, the militants in Iraq and Syria. So you have the, you know, ISIS, ISIS, right? So what's ISIS? Islamic State, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Okay, so that's the whole abbreviation of ISIS. So it's a form of conflict that combines, okay, non-state actors like illegal immigrants 
cyber attacks and those state actors who functions within the sovereign uh, state territories territories like uh, for example in India right we have our own borders uh, or say for example in Ukraine you have your own borders and uh, you know stuff like that so you know some of the authors like Dombrowski and Reich points out okay that the non and counter proliferation policies um, will remain among the foundational elements of American you know security policy okay so you know why I wanted to point this out why you know there's this huge debate about you know immigrants and you know sort of demeaning the immigrants and telling them like these are the people who are going to destroy your country and you know uh, things like that which is actually happening in many parts of country especially in India as well I think uh, you know um, I think we do have security risk we do have nuclear threats you know um, and you know this cannot be uh, unaccounted for okay whatever it is so you know some of, some of these illegal immigrants why I say this uh, we cannot you know uh, sort of declassify them because they are classified and uh, they are dangerous too sometimes you know See, because some of these illegal immigrants okay and enemies of you know these certain countries okay um, who hold like a very you know uh, military power uh, who, who hold political power as well uh, especially in Afghanistan too I think we have the whole the rise of Taliban uh, they smuggle nuclear weapons man you know they can smuggle like plutonium like inside any country without any trace okay so I think this is very important to point out okay that much of the media also has been reporting okay but you know the intelligence and you know the groundwork is what we researchers uh, you know folks like me or you know people who are interested in um, security or you know diplomacy or international relations we, we kind of uh, delve more into it so that's why I'm speaking about the hard truths okay so you know yes a lot of people have been uh, demeaning or have been demonizing Trump uh, on a very bad light okay especially his policy on immigration and I've spoken to a lot of conservatives and I've spoken to a lot of people uh, from the right wing uh, and they actually agree that okay I think yes there was a lot of things that Trump had championed for and you know we love the whole aspect of America first but I think a lot of folks from the right also tell tell me that okay I think the immigration his immigra immigration policy was not too uh, too good okay you know but you know it was sort of proposed also during the Bush and Obama administration if you actually think about it and if you if you you know if you're a follower of you know United States politics why because you know okay here's an author okay I did my research and here's this Elliot Young okay in his article in which was published in Huffington Post uh, 1st March 2017 the hard truths about Obama's deportation policies okay so remember how Obama sorry Trump wanted all the Mexicans to be deported and go back you know telling them to go back home well you know it started off back in Obama time okay why I say this because after doing a little bit of digging and snooping around um, it tells a whole different story okay so Trump wasn't the only one from 2009 to 2015 56 of all immigrants removed from the country had no criminal convictions okay so this is actually very important uh, so th these were you know folks who didn't have any uh, criminal records but they were like chased away okay um, so the Trump's second strategy in his non-liberal stance on NATO policies like I said you know this whole NATO policy is also very important now with the rise of nuclear weapons and uh, Russia and Ukraine war so the Trump's second strategy is his non-liberal stance on uh, NATO especially NATO politics <laughs> which you know I suppose disappointed many European allies uh, which is a given okay usually EU and uh, a lot of folks from Europe are uh, they're kind of liberal in many ways but not liberal in some aspects as well but I don't want to get too much into it the third 
is his ambition to suppress North Korea. All right, okay, so we're talking about the nuclear developments that took place uh, during uh, during a particular time uh, when it was almost like Cold War again between Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, he suggested that even Japan should develop nuclear weapons, okay, offering a defensive strategy uh, for, you know, for uh, sort of a Japan to curb out any uh, attacks such as, you know, North Korea for the United States or anyone, okay. He suggested uh, that Japan should, you know, make nuclear weapons, okay. So according to Trump, in response to North Korea's missile test, he said, we're sending an armada, very powerful, uh, we have submarines, we have, you know, he said we, he had you know, very, very powerful aircraft car uh, carriers and um, stuff like that. You know, he was like almost uh, sort of bullying uh, North Korea. So, you know, well, obviously there was, you know, the Trump administration, like uh, they were sort of, you know, burning out from their, from their patience, I suppose. So he also saw, saw North Korea regime as a major threat, I think. Uh, uh, to America from nuclear missiles attack uh, because you know his policies point towards an offensive strategy so remember I was telling you about what is offensive strategy and what is defensive strategy so he was you Donald Trump was using a very offensive strategy okay when it came to warfare per se or you know uh, when it when it comes to um, you know realism or well rationality sorry uh, rationality in terms of international theory. Um, in our example of the acquisition of nuclear weapons, okay, as a rational strategy, okay, is the formation of nuclear, National Nuclear Security Administration, and an SC, okay, sort of like kind of sounds like, uh, N, you know, NASA or NASA, so it's NNAC, okay. So this was actually formed in March 2010, okay, uh, which was directed by the U.S. government, obviously. Um, the Congress actually created this NNSC. Uh, it was like a sort of a political gambit, okay? And they sort of passed the bill, I think. Uh, and, you know, the semi-autonomous, I think, mo uh, votes maybe. I'm not sure how the agency sort of came about, but, you know, I think politics was also involved in it. Uh, so, but obviously this whole... And then uh, was part of the Department of Energy as well, uh, because if you look back in the 1999, uh, there's a particular act. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which act is that. Uh, you can look it up for yourself. I'll put the comments down below. But there's there was a certain act that uh, that had like sort of policies and um, issues relating nuclear uh, crisis. Okay, so this is all part of the American. Um, security and this is very important because uh, you know it's clearly responsible for the security of the public of America the free country of the world okay so anyways uh, that was Trump's strategy so it was a very offensive strategy okay so you know this was part of the whole nuclear security administration uh, aspects now let's move on to the North Korea's myth of sovereignty okay so some scholars okay as I've, I was doing my research, described North Korea, okay, DPRK, um, as a hermit kingdom. I think, you know, folks who study about the North Korea, they will understand what I'm saying. It's called a hermit kingdom. Why? Because hermit is like a, you know, it's like an, um, I don't know if it's an amphibian or, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, it's a hermit, okay, basically. It goes inside the hermit's uh, how well home and never, you know barely comes out so hermit could be defined as a person who is you know religious and living in solitude um, or very politically minded uh, when it comes to uh, you know DPRK is uh, communist party but it is it is you know DPRK is a country North Korea is a country that excluded itself from the rest of the rest of the world as we all know you know however if the hermit is you know attacked or provoked by other countries like the United States uh, as as how Trump uh, was clearly provoking uh, Kim Jong-un well you know the hermit 
you know, will advance. You know, it's it's very natural. It's a very human phenomenon. Okay, it's a human reaction for him to uh, for the country to react. Uh, then you know, it becomes a form of a defensive strategy. Okay, uh, or it could be an offensive too because he wanted to, you know, put the bombs in America. So. But it started off as a defensive strategy, okay? So North Korea's government had been very successful in excluding their population um, from the globalized world. Basically, they were very successful in um, just isolating their people, I think. Uh, you know, the regime's military and scientists were busy making nuclear weapons uh, despite international pressures uh, from the United Nations, uh, the United States and other international organizations, uh, maybe other countries too. However, the United States put pressure uh, to suppress a possible attack in North Korea, okay, and its nuclear developments under Trump's grand strategy, okay. Um, so obviously, the North Korean regime was very quick to act because they thought it was a threat. Um, in so, in act of not cowardice, but maybe an act of defense um, to protect their right to sovereignty um, within the nation states or, you know, um, yeah, within their territory, uh, sovereign uh, freedom, I, su I suppose. Uh, so anyways, uh, this whole idea about uh, the defensive strategy uh, was actually kind of uh, very prevalent among North, you know, with the case of North Korea, I think. Okay, so, you know, in the case of North Korea's regime, okay, the authorities from the government uh, and the military are engaging in a collective action of mutual defense, like I said. So it's very clear, okay, so, you know, because, you know, they have mustered a lot of power and ways to persuade the country's uh, population into believing that the United States uh, and its allies are a threat to North Korea's survival. You know, uh, if you go to North Korea, like there's like, you know, propaganda everywhere against the United States. They're the evil people. They're the evil country um, and maybe their allies, too. So, you know, watch out, <laughs> Americans, you know, he, they're 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 up for grabs, man. You know, better be careful with that. But anyways, for the North Koreans, their threat is a doom of a nuclear Armageddon. It's not very, it's not rocket science to understand that. Why? Because I could argue, okay, that North Korea is a very small population country, uh, and even the the place is very small too. Uh, it could easily be wiped out by powerful, you know, propelled, you know, flights or drones of nuclear, you know, bombs or nuclear missiles in a very short period of time. You know, if you think about the rationality of what Kim Jong-un was thinking, it is very arguably undeniable, you know, very hard to detract from their rationality uh, of the threat that was posing from the larger, you know, the big America, right? Where, you know, American land is much powerful, much bigger, and, you know, a couple of nuclear weapons won't do any damage towards America, okay? Therefore, the context of the country's political socialization cannot be judged in its entirety, okay? So to better understand the current situation, okay, which one has to look into the history of North Korea, I think uh, if I may maybe reiterate a little bit about what uh, Smith was saying, uh, Smith is one of the author about, uh, you know, the articles that I was reading. Uh, maybe I'll put the, you know, the link down below you know, Smith goes on to say that there's this particular philosophy that North Korea, uh, you know, follows, and it's called uh, J-U-C-H-E. Mm. I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, but maybe some of my South Koreans uh, can help me out. J-U-C-H-E, ju -chi or something like that. Philosophy that has stressed uh, self-reliance um, and, you know, sort of a abhorrence to what is called uh, flunkism, okay, which meant any form of subordination to foreign influences. So they were, you know, they were kind of like very, um, 
like a hermit kingdom um, country, okay? It did not fully reject contact with the foreign communities, but they had their, you know, um, disapproval of what the world was uh, going about and what the world had to say uh, towards North Korea. So they were, they were on their own, basically, you know. Uh, anyway, so, okay. Let's go and let's go ahead and talk about uh, China's uh, justification of offensive nuclear you know, uh, capability. I think this is very important. Uh, and what China says about the United States nuclear war, warheads and uh, their policies, okay? So the rise of the global power and their acquisitions, okay, uh, of nuclear weapons all across the world, okay, uh, especially China's rise, I think, shows a pattern of great security issues for the United States and other powerful countries with nuclear uh, capabilities. Why I say this is because, you know, China's a rising country, okay, and it, you know, economically, you know, they can pretty much buy off a lot of plutonium from any, uh, you know, resource country, okay, uh, you know, and missiles too. So the United States being the dominant power in nuclear arms race, you know, is very attentive, okay, it's very attentive to China's acquisition of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. You know, the rational defense strategy, um, like I said again, the defensive strategy again, uh, according to actually one of the authors, and I uh, I kind of picked up, it was a Chinese, um, you know, scholar, I think, Zhang, or Z-H-A-N-G, he points out that, you know, China, uh, China's evolving perception of U.S. missile defense have been the key driver, okay, of its nuclear modernization efforts. So pretty much Zhang is saying that, okay, you, so from a Chinese perspective, I think the Chinese are saying you guys are, you know, making or have made a lot of nuclear weapons. Uh, what about us? What about our defensive? You know, what about our people? Right? So, you know, you get the gist of it, right? Uh, you know, there was another incident I read in the article that it said the United States uh, spy ships were publicly reported uh, to be seen on March uh, 2009. I think this is also in a newspaper, okay? I, I, but anyways, I didn't catch up on that. But uh, it was also known as the impeccable incident, you know, for tra tracking China's nuclear submarines. Submarines located in Hainan Island in South China, okay, South China Sea. On the other side of the story, one could say, okay, that the rational defense strategy again for the U.S. was to protect its allies and the U.S. ships from becoming an open duck target by Chinese nuclear submarines. Okay, so it's a give and take, I think, from for for any uh, rational actors or any rational countries. Uh, to kind of poke each other's noses and like, you know, blame each other, okay? So, let me just go ahead and give you a little bit of uh, the technical aspects of, you know, what China has been, act, you know, acquiring, okay? You know, despite China's limited number of nuclear weapons, okay, and submarines, uh, well, compared to French, British, Russia, or the United States. You know, China had acquired Type uh, 094, okay, which is a nuclear submarine, okay. Uh, you have DF-31A, okay, which is uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Okay, that's pretty uh, deadly. This is what Kim Jong-un was, you know, eyeing for. And you have JL-2 submarines, okay. Uh, so in a Chinese article published by Navy and Merchant Ships in 2007, as I was looking, uh, lo you know, looking out for, uh, you know, some of my research work, uh, so I'll put the link down below, okay, but it's titled uh, Aegis Equipped Warships Post Treads Around the Periphery, okay, by, it's by Dan Yanli, okay. So basically, uh, it points out that the U.S. missile defense intrusion and its growth had caused the birth of China's nuclear expansion. Okay, so basically, all the countries, for example, even uh, North Korea is saying like, or China is saying that, you know, you guys are making a lot of nuclear weapons, we're going to make as well, okay. And we're going to go about how India had, India had done this also, but, 
just hang in there. So, you know, by lo from looking from a Chinese or China's point of view, you know, the Chinese military are justifying their actions by acquiring nuclear weapons as a defense national strategy, okay? Because the US defense power, okay, and their, you know, offensive nature, which is, uh, which was very prevalent during Bush time as well, okay? So, you know, however, in the long run, okay, you know, I think what China has been saying uh, is that China want a more mutual nuclear dialogue with the United States, okay? So this implies that China is kind of seeking a global hegemony, okay? Um, so that's kind of like what, uh, you know, Zhang, the author, uh, was kind of pointing out. Um, and I feel like that's kind of uh, what many other countries are justifying, you know, that, you know, we want a sort of a global deterrence or global, uh, you know, equal rights or footing to defend our own people or own nations. So I get that part, okay? It's not rocket science. You know, uh, I read another sort of an article by Thomas S. Kuhn, okay, in his work, Pragmatic Work, okay, uh, Paradigmatic Work, sorry. Uh, paradigmatic Work, it points out, in this article it points out that Within the scientific community, dominant conceptual frameworks, uh, which is the parad paradigms, you know, are constituted by sets of fundamental assumptions. Uh, number one, a successful paradigm is one whose fundamental assumptions continue for some length of time to provide a fruitful base of for problem solving. So this is kind of like a little theoretical aspects, but I don't want to get too much into it. Okay, uh, maybe, you know, folks from international relations or political science or, you know, who study this kind of field may, might find it interesting, but I'm just going to uh, ramble on. Okay, so, okay, let's go ahead and talk about the Indian defense strategies perti pertaining to nuclear, okay, and then we'll sort of uh, close with that. You know, it was during 18th May, uh, 1974, okay, let's see who's in line here. Paradigmatic work. Okay, uh, maybe you know folks from international relations or political. Okay, so it seems like uh, we have some views here. So India's um, defense strategy. Okay, um, it was during 18 May 1974. India had successfully tested her first at atomic bomb. Okay, which was in Pokhran, Rajasthan, ordered by in Indira Gandhi who was then the Prime Minister, okay. So, you know, the code name was called uh, Operation Smiling Buddha. I don't know if you've heard of it, but, you know, uh, that was the code name, right, for the India's first uh, atomic bomb in Pokhran, Rajasthan, okay. So despite early initiatives in India joining the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Stra Treaty, or CTBT, it had withdrawn gradually because uh, because other main nuclear armed countries did not accept India's terms and conditions of the treaty. Okay, uh, you know actually this didn't go too well with India. Uh, why? Because you know it was like a threat to India's national security. You know when other people, other countries are telling India not to make you know nuclear weapons. You know maybe India thought it was a little hypocritical. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I think that's a pretty fair judgment, I would say. Uh, so India also said, like, okay, look, you know, we're also we're also on board with the whole nuclear, uh, you know, defensive, you know, strategy or di diplomacy. You know, uh, so you know, the increasing number of nuclear weapons all over the, over the years shows that India is actually taking a rational choice option by pursuing acquisition strategy or sort of a defensive, I don't know, if, would you call it a defense, defensive strategy or offensive strategy? Uh, comment down below. So, you know, looking at the security crisis in India, it is directly linked to the recent terrorist attacks uh, and the strategic maneuvers, uh, both politically and militarily in Pakistan and China. Uh, for example, the Mumbai terrorist attacks uh, and China's arms dealing uh, with Pakistan, 
right? With other and, and maybe other boring areas as well. I'm not sure about the boring areas, but um, you know, you cannot count that out as well. Um, which poses a threat to uh, India's sovereignty. Okay, so I was reading one of the articles by an Indian author, uh, Thakur. Okay, in his article, India's nuclear arsenal is growing. Okay, so I I, I think uh, I'm going to put the link down below, just so you know. Uh, you know, Thakur basically he pointed out um, to sort of sum it up that India's Arsenal is growing. Okay, uh, it is estimated to possess about nine, you know, ninety to one hundred and ten, you know, uh, warheads. Okay, uh, which consist of you know missiles and aircrafts and other sorts of uh, bombs. Okay, I think. Uh, so, yeah, bombs. I'm not sure, but definitely missiles and aircrafts. Okay, about one hundred and ten warheads. So that was during two thousand fourteen. You know, I don't know how much it is right now, but these these numbers were. You know, retrieve. So I kind of looked it up, and it was in the uh, SIPRI. You can Google that SIPRI. It's a yearbook in 2013, uh, which talks about the international security all over the world. So uh, that's where I found that database. Okay. Uh, so India is increasing uh, production of weapons, uh, particularly weapons grade plutonium. Okay. Estimates uh, around 100. Well, 540 kg. Okay, that's a lot actually. Uh, positive, negative, 180 kgs. Okay, that's that's a lot. And highly enriched uranium. Okay, HEU, which amounts to about 2.4 kgs. Okay, that is still a lot. Okay, and I think it has increased as well by now. So some of the nuclear weapons India possesses are the INS Chakra. Okay, uh, <laughs> power, which is a attack submarine. Okay. You have the INS Vikrant aircraft carrier, which carries nuclear missiles, okay? Then you have Agni-V intercontinental ballistic missiles, okay? You have INS Arihant 6000 uh, ton nuclear powered submarine, okay? Uh, you have Prithivi 2 nuclear missile, okay? And you have a couple of others, the new stuff. I'm, I haven't done a lot of research on the new stuff, but yes, uh, that's still on the process I believe so uh, you know I presume it is okay so I think the whole deal with whole uh, you know Indian India acquisition acquisitioning uh, nuclear weapons is sort of a defense strategy uh, and you know actually even Bill Clinton kind of was uh, okay well I'm going to read an article by, uh, it was a letter by the Prime Minister Vajpayee to President Bill Clinton, okay, it was published by an important Indian newspaper, which is Hindu. Uh, it was published on the 14th of May, 1998, which pointed out that China, an overt nuclear weapon state, okay, had committed aggression against India in 1962, hmm, and second military uh, I think it was a military attack in Pakistan yeah uh, so you know I think that's why India is trying to acquire like nuclear weapons you know because of the attacks that time and also in Mumbai as well the bombing in Mumbai and um, yeah I think that's one of the reasons okay so anyways, uh, I think the justification part, we kind of get it, okay. Uh, so since World War I, okay, until the end of Cold War, traditionally, you know, uh, people actually kind of, you know, fought about without any, uh, you know, any sanctions because, you know, it was a war, okay. Um, so, you know, despite the fact that there's certain laws uh, and certain policies that, you know, publicly or legally uh, tells other countries not to build weapons um, or sanctions that, is, that, that, that has been put forth uh, against Russia as well and North Korea as well, you know, um, what you know these are despite the new laws and all the myth of all this like okay you know 
we're gonna have well I hope it's I hope it's a myth uh, regarding the Armageddon of World War three uh, you know wars have been prevalent okay wars doesn't create any goodness in this world and I think we all need some peace here and you know Europe definitely need. here's my thing okay okay the whole war looming in Ukraine and um, Russia I think you know you, you Europe should also understand that Asia you know China and India uh, you know they're also nuclear weapons power you know uh, so and the, I think even the United States should be also aware okay uh, the fact that Asia is also a big player in this uh, international politics and international relations and affairs so I think you know Ukraine and Russia and Europe and you know United States or the West should also listen to what the Asian states or the Asian countries have to say okay you can't just discredit and just fight your own wars and create another Vietnam 2.0 or whatever it is it's not good man yeah so uh, despite the new international laws and the you know myth of all this like you know warmongering and uh, which is still persisting today and uh, other emerging political entities uh, such as like I said going back to the immigrants again you know it's it's the militants it's the rogue warriors it's the you know crazy like you know crazy people like ISIS and all this like you know Taliban and all that stuff which kind of like directs us you know in like okay you know if imagine there's a war in Afghanistan okay I think it's gonna be you know catastrophic okay so because you know you know if the Taliban had nuclear weapons they're gonna fire it man whatever it is so you know yes I understand but I think there needs to be peace and I think Asia uh, needs to come forth with this whole Ukraine crisis because I think we had enough of this whole COVID case as well COVID you know situation but neither the less uh, I think that's it for my podcast um, but hopefully you guys join me again and I will see you guys in my next podcast all right okay you guys have a good one